Hello, everybody. My name is Ken Davenport. This is the Producer's Perspective podcast, and I'm going to just say it. We have a producing legend on the podcast today. Please welcome one of the most prolific play producers and most successful play producers on Broadway, Nell Nugent. Welcome, Nell. Thank you so much, Ken. So we're talking The Elephant Man, The Gin Game, Amadeus, Dracula, Night Mother. These are just a few of the many, many shows on Nell's resume. Go to her IBDB page. It's about 27 pages long. Actually, just scroll down and down and down. Uh, she's also done a bunch of television and film. She's got a handful of Tonys, Drama Desk, you name it. And she's still doing it this past season alone. Latin History for Morons and M. Butterfly. So... Do you actually know the number of plays you've produced? Do you know the number? Ken, I have to tell you, I really don't know the number. And it gets multiplied by when you say you did the road company and the London company and the this and the that, and you say, oh, I don't know. I really haven't bothered to count. Do you have a favorite? Oh, yes. And it's always the same answer. Mornings at 7. And why? Why was that one your favorite? You know, Mornings at 7, Liz McCann and I produced in, you know, give or take a day or two, the end of the 70s, say 78. And it was a play that had been neglected. It had failed twice before. And Paul Osborne at that point was about, the author was about 81 years old and hadn't gotten the recognition in theater that he certainly had in film. And the cast was Maureen O'Sullivan, Nancy Marchand, David Rounds, Liz Wilson, Teresa Wright, Gary Merrill, and on and on, who had had careers, terrific careers, and then kind of went off the radar a bit. And when it hit, and it hit really big, in the middle of a transit strike, I might add, it was such a vindication for everybody who'd been involved in it. And people just swooned over it. Chauncey Howell, who was the critic for CBS, I believe at the time, was had tears streaming down his face when he was doing his review saying, I had such a good time. You just have to go. And I guess we brought good luck to the city, too, because the transit strike was over that night. You saved the city, right? Yeah, I know, single-handedly there. at the Lyceum Theater. So what, what makes a great play? What is it about... Mornings at 7 at that moment, or when you pick up a play, what is it that says, oh, this is a good one? Well, it's interesting. Mornings at 7 had been written in 1938 and was a play of innocence. It really was. And Vivian Matalon, who was the director, said to Paul Osborne, who are these people? And Paul said, they're my sisters. And he said, when was that? And he said, 1919. Everybody who produced it up until that, the point of Vivian's production, which we did, had set it in 1938. Well, 1938, it was very hard to be innocent. Hitler was on the, the move. Mussolini was on the move. The, the world was fragmenting. America was trying not to be so isolated, but a lot of people were... Ha- I, well, you know what was going on historically at the time. So it seemed a little naive, I guess, producing it as if it were contemporary to 1938, But you put it into 1919 in the era of good feeling after the end of World War I and a new period of prosperity, it made sense. So can a great play fail because it's produced at the wrong time? Well, either produced at the wrong time or interpreted incorrectly uh, or in a way that the play won't bear. Sure, we've seen many, many theater pieces interpreted and reinterpreted and reinterpreted, Shakespeare alone. But not all of them can take an an attitude or directorial concept that is antithetical to the play itself. So you have to be careful about what the concept is. I mean, for a revival, to me, you always have to have a concept. Why are we doing this now? So with Dracula, it was all about Edward Gorey's designs. And what makes you personally want to produce a play? What makes you go, oh, this I'm doing this one? Well, for better or for ill, I do it because A, it connects with B and with me, and B, I think I know how to market it. And if I can't figure out how to market it and to whom to market it, then I shouldn't do it. And I try not to. So that's the balance between the art and the commerce. Yeah, right? very much so. So how did all this start for you? Where did you get bit by the theater bug? How did you get into producing? Oh, Ken, I'm the black sheep of my family. 
No one knew was where it came from. I popped out saying, I'm going into theater. And, uh, and that was in the era of when women didn't just fill in the blank, and they didn't. So it was not easy. It was very hard. My father, who was a very prominent attorney and who certainly encouraged intellectual curiosity and achievement in his female child, came home one night and said, women are an abomination in the court. He'd gone up against a, a female attorney for the first time, and I I guess I was eight or nine. And I, oh, this doesn't sound so good. <laughs> it was pretty bad. Yeah, so it was very hard for them, my mother and father, to understand ambition and wanting to do something other than be what later became June Cleaver. Do you remember feeling like, but I'm going to do it anyway? Like, how, well, how did there you was overcome no, that? There was no argument. Um, I probably was the most boring kid you ever met because when everybody else was playing doctor and nurse and cops and robbers and whatever, I was playing theater, um, which is great, you know, and I would trade grades for going to see theater. We lived not far from the city in New Jersey, and my mom grew up in the city. So, oh, it's not about me, Jack, she'd say, about it's her. She she wants to go. It's not about me. <laughs> of course, we both would go herring off to New York and have a great time. My brother couldn't have cared less. So, yeah, I got to see a lot. And I guess I started wanting to be an actor because I didn't know there were other jobs, which excites me about some of the initiatives the league has now about teaching kids about non-performing jobs, careers in the theater. I think that's excellent. Yeah, so many of us, me included, get into it because of acting. Because, again, it's the only thing we know. You mean they don't make up those words? <laughs> no, I, I'm a big believer that I think all high school musicals should assign a producer of the high school musical. Some student that has a business mind, I'm sure, to, to run that there so they can uh, start cultivating the next... That's a cool idea. It really is. I I certainly get zigzagged my way into it. I was doing summer stock, I guess, from the time I was about 15 or 16, and then discovered backstage. It was Balboa and the Pacific. It was so exciting. And they didn't have courses in stage management then or arts management programs. I mean, I'm always thrilled to see these or do lectures for these schools that have them. And I came into New York after graduating. I'd done about four or five seasons of stock at that point as a stage manager, not knowing that women weren't. <laughs> Anyhow, I got hired and hired and hired and then moved on. And But let's talk. So what was the first show you produced, the first one? Well, I went to work for Jimmy Needlander in 69, I guess. Liz McCann was already there. And we produ we convinced Jimmy that we had to produce to keep the real estate occupied. I mean, real estate just gets cockroaches and rats if nobody's in it. And it was a low point of production. I mean, if you look up the stats then, almost nobody was producing. There were empty theaters everywhere. So we had both out-of-town theaters and New York theaters. So we would root, produce something, root it through New York or root it out of New York to the road. And it worked. So we produced quite a number of things in Jimmy's name. But the first thing we did after we left Nederlander in our own name was Dracula, which did okay. I, I've heard of that one before. <laughs> it did okay. It did pretty well. When you were coming up, and you know, maybe it was Jimmy, maybe it was somebody else, best piece of advice you got about producing when you were starting out? Oh, Jimmy, I have to tell you, Jimmy Needlander was the smartest man I ever worked with or for. And Jimmy's brilliance was that he never let you know how smart he was. Of course, we who were around him all the time knew. And I remember he had a very distinctive accent, if you recall, and he called me Nugget rather than Nugent. Hey, Nugget, he would say. And he taught me on day one that the house has the edge, and it's all about real estate. So the second I understood the legitimate theater on Broadway was all about real estate, I thought I was ahead of the gang, and I really was, because that's exactly what it is. It's a real estate game. 
And back then, what was the most important skill that a producer had to have? Well, the same as now, Ken, getting the show on. I mean, we still had to raise money. Jimmy wasn't writing the checks. Uh, We had to put together the project, the creatives, the money, the schedule, the blah, 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 the advertising campaign, the whole thing. No different. And so let's, I want to break out a little bit, each one of those elements for a second. Raising money then versus raising money now, any difference? Hugely different. Then investors were investors, sometimes also called angels and didn't necessarily seek recognition for that. At a time and place, they wanted recognition, and so they became co-producers or whatever for a certain amount of investment in a particular show, which rose or fall. But it was one or two names over a show then, and the investors, bless them, showed up opening night and had a good time, but were not necessarily wanting to be part of the the operation or the creation of the piece or the management or the advertising of the piece, whereas now a number do. And is that troublesome for you, problematic, a benefit, make well, the it easier, answer, harder? The answer is yes and no. I tend to be very careful and concerned about who I work with because I, I want people who bring something aside from a checkbook to it. And I, I find that a lot of the the co-producers that I've worked with over time bring wonderful skills, sometimes in education, sometimes in marketing, sometimes in group sales. There was on just now on the Leguizamo show, one of the co-pros was the best group salesperson I ever met outside of the profession. He just kept bringing groups in. And I'm not talking about little groups. They were 35 to 100 people per group. And he was just... He was a, a, a laser-seeking, you know, a heat-seeking laser. Jeremy and group. It was really, he was really so valuable. And what about marketing? How has that changed since when you got started to now? Well, you know as well as I do how it's changed. I mean, we have outlets that we never had before. The whole digital world is out there for us to market, to confuse us, uh, to give us metrics, to give us chart after chart after chart. Uh, Sometimes, yeah, we still do it by the seat of our pants, but we do have a lot of more information than we had in the past to make what we hope is an intelligent decision. And what about the art of playwriting today? Do you think playwrights are better today than they were? How has that changed? Is there more craft? Well, I particularly am excited, and if you look at what I produced, um, about the diversity in writers. It really is, to me, it's a joy and a privilege to present John Leguizamo on Broadway. He speaks to the Latino audience in a, in a totally inside manner, but it doesn't exclude the white audience. I mean, when we finally made the deal, John said, let's go and brown up the great white way. <laughs> and I thought that was great. And I've done plays by... David Henry Wong, by um, Lydia Diamond. I did um, a Horton Foote play. I mean, couldn't be a whiter writer. Re- just recast uh, by brilliant director Michael Wilson with a black cast. And the play worked entirely. It was Cicely Tyson, Cuba Gooding Jr., Vanessa Williams, and Condola Rashad, wonderful cast. And you know we only had to change two words in the entire Horton Foot script. The character that Vanessa Williams plays refers to herself by a movie star's name. She said, people say I look like. And the original line was Lana Turner. So we changed it to Lena Horn, and it worked. That was it in the whole script. It worked perfectly. And it was a show for which... Geraldine Page won the Oscar for playing the role that Cicely Tyson then won the Tony for playing the role. How about that? Is that good? That's really good. Good producer right there. You you touched on this a bit with your parents, maybe, or at the beginning. Women were doing fill-in-the-blank, never mind the theater. Once you got into the theater, did you find resistance for, for being a woman to want to be in such a leadership role as, as a producer? Were people trying to keep you down? Duh. 
question. Well, it was a leading question. It was really, it's really funny. Because when we were working for Jimmy, Liz and I were, you know, every door was open. Everything was just fine. We raised all the money. I mean, Liz and I would say that from Jimmy said, the moment he said, okay, we're going to do the play, to opening night, he had not a clue what happened. However, we left Nederlander, went out on our own, and suddenly, oh, well, you're not with Jimmy anymore. I mean, should we be investing with you? Should we should we support you? Uh, do you know what you're doing? <laughs> it was just amazing. Yeah, there was a big difference. And did you have to do anything, shift anything to get... What did, what did you do to overcome that? Because obviously you did. Produced three hits in a row. Three hits in a row. <laughs> That'll do it. We were so lucky, Ken. We had no idea what we were doing. We it really, we were extremely lucky. I mean, with what we picked and what we did. I I love when genius people, of which you are one, (laughs) say to me, "We had no idea what we were doing." What did you pick? What were those those hits that you? Well, it was Dracula was the first, and I don't mean that we were stupid about it when we. The play came to us because I lived on West 87th Street then, and I had a darling little Yorkie dog who I'd wait, I'd walk up and down the street. And there was a, a man who was renting a, an apartment down the block named John Wolf. And he and I developed kind of a passing on the sidewalk friendship. He didn't have a dog, he was one. And one day, this normally sunny person was walking around like a leprechaun who'd had his pot of gold stolen. And it turned out his backer, or this Dracula he'd been telling me about, had gone off to Hollywood and left him holding the play. So out of nowhere, I said, well, come down and see us. And that started Dracula. Now, what we did was we stopped the motor because there was no way to get it ready that season, that fast, get all of the marketing, get the money, get the theater, get everything into position. And he was very upset, but... I think by delaying a year, we made it much more possible to be successful. Then the following year, Richmond Crinkley, rest his soul, came to us saying he'd had this, seen this play in London and was going to produce it at the York Theater, would like us to work with him um, and get aboard right now. And we read it and said, okay. And that was, that was one where we had to transfer like that, which we did. And it was a huge success. And then Mornings at 7, well, I told you the story of Mornings at 7, and that's what happened. So I want to go back to Dracula for a second. So first of all, a chance encounter on the street leads to Dracula, which is an amazing story. Exactly. A chance encounter on the street. You you said earlier that one of the reasons you did that was because of of the designs. For those listeners out there who may not be familiar with that production, describe what you mean by that. Like, Well, there was a great American artist, also I guess you'd call him a cartoonist, named Edward Gorey, who had a really twisted, dark look life. And John Wolfe had the brilliance to go to him to ask him to design the show. And it was three huge sets. I mean, there were 33 foot high sets and three act play and it needed an attitude toward it it had to be treated seriously but it needed just the tiniest little feeling that kind of we know this isn't real and that was very much the gory attitude in his sketches in his work so the sets were all black and white with a touch of red in every set and it was it was a uh, it was an attitude that was reflected also in the way Dennis Rosa directed it, in the way Frank Langella acted it, in the way Ann Roth designed the costumes. They all were totally serious, but had just that little, well, we know it's not real. But it also was scary as hell in places, too, and very, very sensual, very sexy. And all these lovely ladies, these mummies, brought their children to see it. And the children love the special effects, and the women love to look at those handsome guys playing Dracula. And we had a long list of them. So, obviously, these three hits in a row helped establish you on your own independently. 
uh, no producer can produce a string of hits for their entire career. There are shows that don't work along the way. How do you as a producer personally deal with a show that doesn't work that you're very invested in? Well, for me, whether they hit or don't hit or fall somewhere in between, I like to go back over them after I open and kind of meet with various people who were involved in the show closely over a period of time and ask questions and kind of evaluate and figure out what I did wrong, what I did right. And sometimes it was just a bad idea gone wrong. You know what I mean? You look back and say, why or what was I thinking? Could you give us an example of a play that you produced that you had that little post-mortem with yourself, which, by the way, is, is such a brilliant uh, brilliant idea and something I try to do. Give us an example of a play that you did where you learned something like, oh, if I, if I had known that, I would have done that differently. Well, I'll, I'll give you an early example. There have been examples all the way along the line. We produced, again, Liz, Liz and I were still partners then. We produced a play called Piaf about Edith Piaf, which starred Jane Lavater and was directed by Howard Davies, brilliant English director, uh, written by Pam Gems, was a great success at the Donmar Warehouse in London. Liz had seen it, I hadn't said, okay, we'll do it. And interestingly enough, we wanted the Ambassador Theatre, which has now had Chicago in it since whenever, <laughs> since the Abraham Lincoln was president. But the sh- Bernie and Jerry got to us and said, you know, you got to have a flagship theater, and they are going to have the flagship theater, put it in the Plymouth. Well, the Plymouth is a, well, it's now the Schoenfeld, is a great theater. It's a wonderful theater. And I remember when Jane Lapater went on the stage the first time, she said, oh, I love this theater. It cuddles you. Well, the thing is, it was a flagship theater, and it was a scruffy show. And after it, you know, well, we did decently, and Jane won the Tony that year. But we didn't do really well. And we both felt if we'd had it at a scruffy house, and the expectation was of a scruffy show, we would have done better. Now, that was our analysis, how right, how wrong, but I'm sticking with that story after 20 years. What do you tell investors when shows don't work and you have to break that news to them? I mean, aside, hey, I was wrong. Um, you know, it's very interesting. You almost, you often see the handwriting on the wall because the, the grosses during previews are not doing well, and I don't try to get expectations too high or too low. All along, I at least try to keep my investors informed so that they know the good stuff that's happening as well as the bad stuff that's happening. And you know as well as I do, bad stuff happens no matter how much you guard every flank. So I try not to let people get ahead of the expectations. Now, sometimes you can't control it. Uh, For instance, when we did Nicholas Nickleby, I mean, there was no way to control the anticipation of that show. I mean, we had the cover of Time magazine. The show was selling out long in advance. I mean, the, I mean, we were just beside ourselves trying to figure out how can we tamp this down? What, God forbid, happens? Well, our press agent at the time, Josh Ellis, said, we can't, you know, just go with the flow and see what happens. And he was right. You couldn't control it, but it did scare us. It was scary, really scary. What do you think about reviews? You've had a lot of reviews in your day. What Do they help? Do they hurt? Do they, can a play survive without them now? Could it not survive without them then? Plays, oh, blessed plays, have always needed reviews, really. And very few plays have overcome reviews. I mean, the musical's totally different. I mean, look what happened to Wicked. <laughs> Who knew? But plays need reviews, and uh, it's hard to overcome them. Almost impossible. So do you, you read all of the reviews that come out for your, your plays? Well, I read them to the extent that I need to read them. In other words, I'm not going to read every single word. You get the gist. He liked it. He didn't like it. It was it. And you deal with it. What about audience response during previews? Do you, are you 
Oh, you li- the same as you listen, listen, listen. They tell you so much. They really do. If you listen really, really hard. You've read Act One by Moss Hart. Mm-hmm. Remember, Kaufman used to turn his back to the to the stage and just listen to the audience, and he, and listen to what they were telling him. And then he told Mouse, as he called Moss Hart, to take out a lot of the jokes. They were laughing too hard, and they weren't getting into the characters. Interesting. Never forgot that one. Yeah, it's a scary thing to do. Yeah. Yeah, and to convince a writer to take away a laugh, or or an actor to give up a laugh. I remember when we were out of town with Amadeus. We were in D.C., and we had what I would call a he. It's an H-I with no T. And, and you could... You could hear the audience go out at the end of Act One. Oh, my God, they were so excited. They talked about nothing but the play at the interval. They came back in the second act all alert, and then all of a sudden you could feel them drifting away. It took a long time to solve it. We did solve it, and it was a great success. Ran over a 1,000 performances, but Peter Hall elected to be the one to tell one of the actors that a key scene of hers was going. And we were all, Peter Schaffer and Liz and I were gathered outside her dressing room as we heard things smashing. And it turned out that she was sending various pots of makeup at the mirrors in the National Theater. She was very unhappy. You've dealt with a lot of stars in your career. Mm -hmm. Do you enjoy working with the big Hollywood stars? Do you find that you have to treat them differently than a theater star? You know... There are people who are reasonable and professional no matter what their rank, as it were, in the business or in a given show. And there are people who are not. And it can be the person with the small role, not the star who is the pain in the tush. I do feel, though, that stars, proper stars, someone who understands his or her responsibility, does set the tone for the show. And he or she comes on time, has done their homework, works professionally, and makes us all laugh from time to time. But it's a, it's a huge responsibility. I mean, yes, they get scared. And if they get scared, they get sometimes ugly. But you have to realize they're the one naked on the stage, not you. And I think I learned that at the stage manager's desk. You know, it's scary. I mean, I watched big names stand in the wings, you know, shaking with fear before they went on. One of them was Helen Hayes. How about that? Does anybody remember who she was? Do you like, they renamed that theater the Hayes? Yes. Not the Helen Hayes? So I asked Carol, did you mean Rutherford B? What do you think of the current state of the theater today? How are we doing? If it was a patient at a hospital. Well, pale face, we're doing very well financially, that's for sure. Creatively, who's to know? It it's, takes a long time. For us to know what are the, the ones that are going to last, that are going to be revived and beloved, and the ones that aren't. Uh, yeah, we've had a certain number of revivals that have been successful and ones that have not. Um, I do love what I'm seeing, though, in off-Broadway and regionals, working with new artists or with uh, mature artists with plays that may not be all that commercial. I was thrilled today to read that Gene Domanian is funding Atlantic Workshop six fellowships for writers. I thought, you go, girl. That's terrific. Yeah, Gene's so committed to that stuff. It's It's just, it's excellent. It's excellent. Okay, my last question, which is my genie question. I want you to imagine that the genie from Aladdin comes to visit you and is prepared to grant you one wish. So now what's the one thing about Broadway that drives you crazy? that makes you angry, that would have you turning up a table, screaming, that would have you throwing things in a dressing room, smashing <laughs> on the wall, that you would ask this genie to wish away? That's a tricky one, because going back to the what I was originally talking about, that it's a real estate game, I would be a lot happier if we had more playhouses. Right now we have long-running, super long-running, ultra-long-running musicals in the big houses. So the big houses are gone for years and years and decades. 
So smart producers scale down their productions to go in the larger of the playhouses, which then means the poor relation is once again the plays. And we have to stand in line with our hats in our hands, begging for theaters. I would like that to change. So would I, actually. <laughs> well, we I all, should think. What's going to happen, though? Because it feels like it's not getting any better for the plays. It's only getting worse. Every year we put on a non, another ultra-long-running hit. Where do the plays go? I wish I knew the answer. And it takes a long time to build a theater, and the Schubert's just abandoned their... Uh, desire to play to build a theater do you think we could ever become like the west end and have no correlation between broadway and off we could have just broadway the, the, well end. the problem is the size of the houses ken you know that i mean we've got broadway houses that have 787 seats or the new hayes the rutherford, the B. rutherford B. hayes theater the yes. rutherford B. hayes theater that has just short of 500 seats but that's going to limit what could go in there would be financially successful. I mean, we have to look at the numbers and say, within a reasonable amount of time, at a reasonable gross, can we recoup with... And that's what we have to show our investors. And they can read just as well as anybody else. They're all very educated these days. And say, hmm, that doesn't look like it's going to fly, Orville. Well, there's a good wish for you. Some more playhouses. Not just more theaters, more playhouses. We'll see what the genie can whip up for us. Thank you so much for being here. Thanks to all of you for listening. We will see you next time.